Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, welcome again. We're so glad that uh, you're worshiping with us. And we're continuing our series today, which is called 1,440 Minutes. If you do the math, it's like 24 hours or not like it is. And uh, what we're really doing is we're journeying this, these last moments of Jesus's life. And the whole um, uh, significance of what we're trying to accomplish is to help us to tune into the victories as well as the pain, as well as um, uh, the teaching, as well as the emotion, the mood, and the passion that happened in those 24 hours. And, and our goal in this series is to really get us there. And as we travel this Lenten season, that's really what we're trying to accomplish. You know, the Lenten season is a season where, where we're called to look inward. We're called to examine ourselves. We're called to find out in, in who we are, how do we come forward as a new creation, uh, bring forward penance and, and um, repentance and confession and all those things. So today we're actually going to be taking a, a journey into uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, Jesus is uh, in Gethsemane uh, with his 12 or 11, I should say at, at this time, because one has uh, run off and will soon betray him. Um, he's he's in, in the garden here, and a lot is going on, and it's important for us to understand the story. Uh, we're going to be journeying all throughout these uh, weeks in Lent through the Gospel of Mark as our primary reference. So let's, let's go to Mark chapter four, uh, 14 for a moment, and I want to take us to verses 32 to 42 as we um, come into contact with what's really going on in this uh, specific time. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. And going a little farther, he fell to the ground, and he prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And we need to remember that, that he prayed that it would pass from him, because we're going to talk a little bit about that. Jesus says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then he returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch just for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And once more he went away and he prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. In returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now we find out as we read through these uh, gospel stories, we find out that the, that the betrayer is Judas Iscariot. And Judas actually sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. But I want to uh, first take us to the scene of where we are in Gethsemane. And I want you to imagine with me for a second. The work is finished. There, there's, there's no more preaching going on. There's no more miracles to be had. Uh, there's an end to the instruction to the apostles. And there's an end to the prophecy. And the time of waiting has literally come. And so Jesus finds himself in this time of waiting as he is contemplating the movement uh, to the cross. So there's, there's nothing of importance. That, that hasn't already been said to the apostles. There's everything that he has wanted them to know, he has poured that out to them. He has said it both publicly and privately, and he has brought them to this particular place. Now, Jesus had to have been feeling at that point that there must be success to the end of his ministry at this particular point. And he has to be thinking that if he is not successful in Palestine, then how can his ministry and God's revelation, how can it compete in Rome with with many gods made of marble, and how can it compete in areas like Carthage and Gaul and Greece and, and all the other places? So Jesus realizes that there is a significance that has to happen in the importance of this ministry that is about to end. So he's also sitting there believing and understanding that not only is he God, but he is also human. 
So he is at this point where he is realizing that not even the God side of him can rescue him from what is about to happen. But with that comes this battling that is happening within his spirit, within his soul, of the contemplation of what awaits him as he looks toward the next steps, which is the cross at, at Golgotha. But it was a time of waiting. And, and one might say that, that, that we can imagine that as they were walking through that garden, as they walked through all of those monumental places, uh, the place of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, where all of the uh, graves were and they could see that, and Jesus is thinking to himself that, that life will come and, and it's called resurrection. They get to the temple, they get to all these significant places and they walk alongside. And they come, as scholars have found, they come to a cave and they go inside of the cave. And, and as they enter the cave, it, it brings us to wonder, you know, could Jesus have spent some more time teaching, praying in the cave with the disciples and arousing them? And the answer is yes, he could. But what had to have been going through his mind was that just a few moments before it came to this point in Gethsemane, the crowds of people were hailing him as he came into Jerusalem. They were hailing him as the son of David. And the Bible proclaims that the son of David is the Messiah. But now his heart is heavy and it's troubled or troubled as he comes to this particular place. Now, Jesus does something that is quite unique, but it's not, um, it's not so unique that, that one could not anticipate it. He asked Peter, James, and John to actually leave with him, to not go into the cave, but to go with him into the Garden of Olivet. And actually, the, the term Gethsemane, many translations put it as, as oil press. So you might want to think about, as he's agonizing in Gethsemane with the prayer, this um, image of, 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 of an olive which is being pressed to get the oil out of it. So he asked Peter and James and John to go with him. And as they go with him, they, they move off into this place and they get to a point where Jesus is ahead of them and they can see through the trees, they can see through the brush. And as the moonlight comes through, what they notice is a suffering mask on the face of, of their beloved. In fact, uh, one can only imagine that, that as Jesus is agonizing in this time and in this place, that it almost might be that the apostles might have been leery of looking upon his face. Because just shortly before that, they remembered a very vibrant and robust Jesus. They remembered a Jesus who was telling stories and was uh, talking about triumph and all of these things. And now all of a sudden things are different. And one might imagine that they saw his hands, the long bony fingers that were now blue and, and gray in, in tones as they were looking at that. And Jesus' eyes bigger than life because he could foresee something that they could not. He could actually see what was next. So that brings us to this place where Peter, James, and John are there. They obviously love Jesus. They want to help him. They wish to console him. But there's nothing that a human being can do at this point to console or to help Jesus. He was beyond any help of man. As a man, he was experiencing the suffering. He was experiencing the emotions of that. And also being that of God, we believe it's called incarnation. We believe he was divinity and humanity. And at that point, we also understand that he sees the things that they cannot see and he realizes what is coming in the end of this, of this message, or this, in the end of this, of this journey. He's finished his work. He's come to this place and it's time to take the next steps. I can imagine as Peter and James and John are in the garden with Jesus and looking through the moonlight and seeing his silhouette and catching his glimpse in some places, that as they see his fist doubled against his chest, as he proclaims the words, I am plunged into sorrow, and he says loudly and he says bitterly, enough to break my heart. The three glance at him sadly, and they have to be able to see the temple behind him. And Jesus says some very simple words, stay here and be awake, remain awake. Now, I explained a little bit last week about the Passover meal, how it became the meal of communion, and the disciples' day started very early that morning, so one must come to understand that they are overwhelmed by fatigue at this point, and they're at a place where, where to do more is just almost impossible for them to do. We imagine Jesus as he moves further into the garden as he leaves Peter, James, and John to pray for him. 
And as he moves to a flat rock and he falls prostrate down onto that rock, proclaiming and calling out to God. And he says this prayer, my father, if it is possible, let this cup be lifted or let it be spared or let it be taken from me. And the lament almost comes involuntarily from his lips. And he says on top of that, and yet, not as I will, but as you will. Now, no one knew better than Jesus at this point as to what was about to happen. And, and, and Jesus realized that the time was coming for him to expire, so to speak, that his death was short to come. And every minute and every hour that he was living and as he was moving with the disciples and, and knowing what the end result was going to be, his humanity became to overwhelm him and came to that point. But he also knew that within God, the Father would be an ultimate victory that would come to him. <coughs> So Jesus is in the garden, and he's waiting. Waiting can be a difficult thing, can't it? Waiting is one of those things where it's, a, it's an intense and poignant of all human experiences. Uh, sometimes it might be easy to say that it's an experience above all experiences, that it uh, strips us of affection and, and, and self-deceptions, and, and it reveals to us the reality of our needs. It expresses and screams to us our values and, our, and, and what we need of ourselves, and waiting at its most intense moment is wearying, <coughs> and it's wearying at that moment. And it can overwhelm us and come in a, in a very powerful way. Let me explain to you what I mean. The nervous actor who is awaiting for the curtain to rise, there's this anticipation. There's this nervousness that's on his heart. The paratrooper who is awaiting that first jump has that anxiety, that anxiousness of what will come. How about sitting in the dentist's chair? The anxiety and the overwhelm and the angst that comes with that. We dread the imminent onset of strain or danger or pain, but we know in our rational minds and we realize that even though there's pain, even though there's drain, that what lies ahead is for the best. And usually rational considerations overcome that dread and our response is a fight or flight and it's mostly we run away. So, so we count it as weakness or, or cowardice if, if we do that, if we run away. We also count it weakness if, if we wait and we find ourselves hoping and praying that that which lies ahead, that which is supposed to be for the best, we find ourselves hoping and praying that just by chance it might not happen. The actor, there maybe there might be weather that causes the play to be canceled and the curtain does not rise. The paratrooper who might be thinking there might be a mechanical failure. The aircraft cannot go off the ground. Therefore, I don't need to make the jump. The dentist's chair. We just hope beyond all means that she'll forget we're back there and not have time for us at the end of the day. There's weakness. There's this pardonable weakness, but nevertheless weakness in hoping or praying to be spared for that which we know to be best for us. And it's there we find Jesus in Gethsemane under the same circumstances. He must wait. He must wait for the hour to come upon him. He must wait for the betrayer to come at any moment. He must wait for his best friend to deny him. He must wait for all the ones who were his friends to run away from him in his greatest time of need. And he must wait knowing that they're about to fall asleep. W.H. Vanstone says that there's, a, that there's another way for us to look at this this waiting thing and this intensity and this emotion that happens. Here's what he says. He says, it's the manner of waiting in which the prisoner in the dock or the prisoner's wife or a mother waits for the jury to announce its verdict. The manner in which an intelligent man waits for the surgeon's report on a biopsy on his liver. The manner in which after an explosion in a coal mine, a wife awaits at the pithead to hear if her own man is safe. One waits at such moments Van Stone says, in an agonizing tension between hope and dread, stretched and almost torn between two dramatically different anticipations. A wise person, he says, will then steal and prepare himself for the worst, but the very tension in which he waits shows that hope is still present, and that hope will often express itself in unbelievers, in the urgent and secret prayer, oh God, please let it be okay. And in such hope and prayer, there is no weakness, Van Stone says. No failure of nerve, 
Torn between rational hope and rational dread, one may properly pray for the best while still prepared for the worst. Now and then John awakened and he could see Jesus agonizing in prayer in Gethsemane and he could, he could hear his words and, and then his eyes too tired, he would shut them again. There was this little, little grove where the Son of Man was beseeching and calling out for mercy to the Heavenly Father to please do something, and yet John could not respond. And so in a real sense, Jesus is alone in the garden. As he's prayed, his anguish deepened. It's unbearable. He stood, he was close to a stupor of fright at the visions that he had seen, and he comes back and, and he sees the three, perhaps seek to seek human comfort, and he's agitated, he's disappointed, he's overwhelmed, he's concerned, and he says to them, <clears throat> how can you be sleeping? Rouse yourselves and pray that you may not succumb to temptation. He was dismayed. At the, at the sight of his defenders grumbling and fumbling and bumbling as they were trying to come up with excuses as, as to why they fell asleep. And they weren't really asleep, they were just resting their eyes. And Jesus looks at them. You see, the 12 may have originally been chosen by the Father, but Jesus the Son chose these three. He chose Peter, he chose James, and he chose John. And these three saw additional sides and inward windows into the heart of the Lord himself. It is only those three that found themselves on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus saw and became overwhelmed with brilliant white as the heavens proclaimed and the visions of Moses and Elijah, which said that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophecy. It was these three, Peter, James, and John, who were with Jesus when he went to Jairus' house and raised his daughter from the dead. These three, Jesus had a vested interest. He had a special bond. And inside, though, he's experiencing his greatest pain and the pain that he is called to endure. And voluntarily, he will willingly take upon the sins of the world and put those upon himself. And with that also, he will not only willingly and voluntarily take our sins, but he will experience even, even greater pain. The pain of his greatest friends turning their back on him. I often go back <clears throat> to this story and I have a lot of emotion when I, when I read these gospel accounts, and maybe you do too. And I come back to this story, and I get to this point in Gethsemane, and, and I begin to just shout with frustration, how can you not stay awake? How can you not defend Jesus? Judas, what are you doing? Peter, why are you saying that you'll defend him, but yet you'll deny him? And I get so wound up about that. And then I hear this little voice in the back of my mind say, Bob, you've done that too. You've betrayed Jesus. You've denied him. You've run away in his greatest time of need. And I truly believe that that's why the gospel writers do not wax eloquently over this description, but they come to us with great truth and they want us to see the, the, the uh, murkiness. They want us to see the ugliness of what was going on and what was thought to be close relationships. And we must live through the fact that those who claim to be the closest to Jesus betrayed him, denied him, and abandoned him. And it gives you and me the opportunity to see that as Jesus looked at them on that very night and said, in my Father's house are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you. And where I am, you will be as well. And we realize that he says that to you and me. So to see all of the deception and the deceit and all, it's important for us, and I'm so grateful that the, that the gospel writers did not wax over that. I find comfort in these narratives to know that in the midst of these betrayals and abandonments and denials that were coming, that Jesus continued to express and choose to love the very ones who would put their back upon him. Jesus went back to pray. And as he went back to pray, it might have been easier to have just said that there's nothing that I need to do with this. But he went back to pray and continued. And the disciples went back to sleep again. And he cries out in agony with those words, almost inclusive of a murmuring that was my father crying out distinctly and loudly. He had to have gathered up enough strength to lift himself from the rock because the scripture tells us that he once again comes and he appears before the apostles. 
and he sees Peter. And he says to Peter, Simon, why are you sleeping? Were you not able to stay awake one hour? Keep awake and pray, all of you, that you may not succumb to the temptation. And in the midst of that, I can just hear Jesus let out a sigh. <sighs> the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This was the moment as true with Jesus as it was his disciples. Jesus too found his flesh weak. Jesus too found his connection, his spirit in all weak as humanity overwhelmed him at this point. The gospel writers begin to also give us descriptions as to what was happening to him. They said that there was salty sweat that was gleaming from his face and forehead and it began to change color. And Jesus ultimately noticed the hue and color and realized that he was bleeding. And the condition continued. Hematidrosis is that condition. And hematidrosis means that you get to a point with such great anxiety, you get to such point with great angst going on in you and turmoil and all, and it's just compounded. And hematidrosis begins to happen where the body is overwhelmed by those feelings and capillaries and subcutaneous capillaries within your, your head begin to open and it intermingles with your sweat glands and those open and all of a sudden blood mixes with your perspiration. And Luke, who's a physician, said that it was of such greatness that it not only was clotting on his beard, but as it was falling on the ground, it was visibly seen. The idea that Jesus is in anguish, that can be somewhat perplexing to some believers, can it? Because we, we want to believe that, 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 that Jesus was God, he was perfect, and he didn't fight this, and he was happy to do this and all those things. Folks, that, that's not at all what was going on here. If that were the case, we would not have read what we read. Nowhere do the gospel writers say that this was a, a song and dance for Jesus. Nowhere does it say that he was so excited to do this that he was doing the happy dance and making things happen. It says he agonized agonized in prayer. The idea that he's in anguish pleading with God is unsettling to some Christians. Some think that, that it evokes um, uh, great compassion. Others begin to think, and they see this image of Jesus asking God to take the cup of suffering from him, that it's an apparent anxiety over the crucifixion. And they begin to say that that lacks nobility and that lacks courage. Others will say that the image may appear to indicate a lack of faith on Jesus's part. They would perhaps expect to see Jesus willingly and wanting to, to face his torture and death without agitation and without fear. But folks, we must never lose sight of this. It's the end result that we need to see, and that is that he willingly, willingly, willingly accepted our sin. In some small way, we can relate to that, can't we? In some small way, haven't you and I been in a Gethsemane experience? In some small way, hasn't God been speaking to us? In some small way, haven't we found ourselves agonizing, pleading to God, please take this cup from me. You can't be asking me to do this. There's no way I'm going to do this. Please show me an easier way. Have we not found ourselves there? Of course we have. Maybe God's calling you into a ministry, into this church. Maybe he's calling you into ordained ministry. Maybe he's calling you to be a missionary. And so often as we look at this, we find ourselves wrestling with these things and we are not so willing to say yes, ultimately seeking and bargaining and wrestling with God. And like the rich young ruler, maybe God is saying to you, it's time for you to define who your God really is. And we're pleading, Lord, take this cup from me. But then the ultimate result is, out of obedience, we find ourselves having to answer. It's not what I want, but it's whatever you want. And we take that step forward. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke allow us to hear Jesus' prayer. And we can identify with Jesus' pain, and I think it's so important for us to see that our Lord is in pain. It's so important for us to, to also know that he's God, but to also remember he's human. It's so important for us to know that, that he makes the example, and to see the anxieties, to see the stresses, to see the strains, to see all that he was enduring makes for us a more credible witness because how could Jesus hardly be a credible witness if he did not have to endure temptation, if he did not find himself ever above the fray, if he was never in the wrestling match? See, Satan battles the heart every day, doesn't he? And every human being, and Satan battles our heart, and, and, our, and our lives are hardwired in a sense that, that you and I will fight for the right to live in everything that there is about us. Whether we are aged, whether we are dying, we are going to fight for life, and that's just the way that we're wired. Our human bodies resist that temptation and resist that ability to just let go. And every wire in Jesus' body was firing in that same circuit that night. And here was a 34-year-old male who obviously was of good health. Why would he not want to live? His body was in perfect condition, and yet he prays the prayer, not my will, but thine be done. What do we learn from this struggle? What do we learn with Jesus grappling this whole deal here. And one thing that I learn is that, that we need to be sure to see, make sure that we see that Jesus is not some joyful martyr who's bent on self-destruction. He's not an unwilling pawn forced into taking on this sacrifice. He is a courageous hero who knows what dangers lie ahead and he resolves to do the will of the Father and that Jesus continued to go through that pain, went through that suffering, died for our sake, tells us something of the character of the very God who creates us. We can learn to handle pain and suffering in our own lives, and Jesus did so, and Mark says that he prayed the prayer, Abba, Father. You've heard me say on many occasions that the interpretation or the Greek word for Abba is Daddy. So here in his greatest need, he's not some eloquent theologian, no Bible scholar. He says, Daddy God, please. Take this cup from me. If we spoke that way in church today in our prayers, Daddy God, we'd probably be thrown out for being irreverent. If we found ourselves pleading, pleading to God like the psalmist and Jesus did in his greatest time of need, we probably would be scolded and told, you don't have any faith. And yet our Lord teaches us that it is perfectly right to come before our Father with honesty and openness and realness. The gospel narrative tells us that there will be anxieties in life and every one of us can relate to a time when, when we ultimately pray just as Jesus did, oh God, not what I want, but what you want. This prayer captures the essence of, of, of our ultimate trust. And let me assure you, it is perfectly okay to stand before God in boldness and lay your heart out to him and to tell him, and to listen to what God is saying. Jesus teaches us it's acceptable to tell God that, that we hope and desire that our cup be removed from us, but that the final word in our prayer is to be simple trust and submission, and that we're to lean into as he ultimately did. So what do we learn about Gethsemane? We learn this prayer. Take this cup from me, yet, not what I want, but what you want.